we come into this place with thanksgiving, Father God. We come into this place with praise, Father God. Oh, Father God, we lift up your name, Lord. We give you praise, honor, and glory. Because we woke up this morning, Father God. We were able to move around and get out of bed and to yes. think right, Father God. Oh, Father God, we can taste our food, Father God. We can speak. We can hear, Father yes, God. Oh, you're a blessing to us, Lord. We thank you, Father God. We thank you for your unconditional love. Oh, yes, Lord. We, we don't take it for granted, Hallelujah, Father God, because you yes, are an awesome God, yes, you are, Lord. And we thank you. Father God, we thank you, Father God. We praise you and honor you, Lord, because you are worthy. You are worthy, Father God, to be praised, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Father God, we praise you through, Father God. Praise you through this pandemic, Father God. Oh, Father God, we praise you through, Father God. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah, Father God. We thank you for this service on today, Lord. We thank you, Father God, for what you're about to do in this place. Hallelujah. We thank you that your presence is here with us, Lord. We thank you, Father God, for the word that will go forth. We thank you for the preparation that took place, Father God. We thank you that our leader, Pastor Terrence Nolan has a heart, Father God, after you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that he seeks you in all things, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in him, Father God. We thank you that you are using him, Father God, to teach your people, Lord. We thank you, Father God, for the word, Lord, that's going to touch and change and transform us, Father God. We thank you, Father God, that he is willing, Father God. He is a willing vessel to ready to be used for the kingdom of God and for your glory, Lord. We thank you, Father God. We thank you for his wife, Latrilla, Father God. We thank you for her strength, Father God. We thank you for her perseverance, Father God. We thank you for her endurance, Father God, to keep moving forward, Father God, to support, Father God, to do whatever needs to be done, Father God, for your kingdom, Father God, and so that your word will go forth. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord, because it is good, Father God. All things that take place today are good, Lord. Oh, hallelujah, Father God. We bless your name, Lord. And we thank you for the praise that will go forth today, Father God. We thank you for all ministries in this place, Lord. We thank you, Father God, that no weapon formed. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. Hallelujah, Lord. We bless you, Father God, that all will go well, Father God, in this service today, Father God, because we are working, Lord, in the power and authority through Christ Jesus. Hallelujah, Father God, that things, Father God, will work how you will have them to work, Father God, because you are in control, Father God, and we are your servants, Father God, so we yield unto you, Father God, and we say yes and amen, Father God, because you are the only one, Father God, who can bring us through, Father God. You are the only one, Father God, who are with us in the middle of the circumstance, Father God. You, Father God, are the reason we are victorious, Lord. Oh, hallelujah, Father God. We bless your name, Father God, and we thank you, Lord, that no one, Father God, no one is lacking, Father God. 
No one is lacking, Lord. We thanking you for each and every member and partner, every donor, Father God, every listener, Father God. Oh, Father God, we thanking you for them all, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord. We thank you, Father God, for your word going through the airways, Father God. We thank you, Lord, that you are forever present, Father God, and nothing can stop you, Lord. It doesn't matter that we don't have a church full of people right now, Father God, because your word shall prevail anyway, Father God, in the name of Jesus, and it shall not return unto us void. Hallelujah, Father God. We bless your name, Lord, and we thank you, Father God. We thank you, Father God, for prosperity in every area of life, Father God, as we give you glory, Lord. We're thanking you, Father God, that we're fully restored spiritually, mentally, and physically, Father God. We thank you, Father God, that as we give our time and talents and our gifts, Father God, that there's a 100-fold return in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Father God. That no one is lacking in any area, Father God. And as a body of Christ, we stand together, Father God. We are on one accord, Lord. And you said where there are two or more gathered, there you are in the midst, Lord. So we thank you for your presence in this place, Lord. We honor you, Father God. We adore you, Lord. And we say hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, Father God. We bless your name, Lord. For you are worthy. You are worthy to be praised, Father God. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy, Lord. Oh, Father God, you are worthy, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in and through us, Father God. We thank you for strength, Lord. We're thanking you for joy, Lord. We're thanking you for peace, Father God. We're just blessing your name, Father God, this morning because you're so good, Father God. And you already know about today, Father God. And we pray that today will be better than yesterday, Father God. That we will be better in ourselves for you, Father God. Because all that we do, Lord, we do it for your glory, Father God. We are not our own, Father God. But we belong to you, Lord. And and we thank you, Father God, that we are a part of the kingdom of God. We count it a privilege and an honor to be here, Father God. We just bless your name, Lord. And we just thank you, Father God, for what you are doing in and through us, Father God. We thank you, Father God, that we're touching souls, Father God, that we're touching hearts, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Father God with the love of God that's coming through us, Father God. We thank you, Father God, for what you're doing in this community, Father God, in this body, Father God, in the name of Jesus. We thank you for each and every person, Father God. We thank you for the word that goes forth today, Father God. And we thank you, Father God, that we will continue to build each other up, Lord that we will speak life into one another, Father God, that we will encourage one another, Father God. Oh, Father God, we thank you, Lord, as you continue to lift us up, Father God. Oh, we bless your name, Father God, because what would we do without you, Father God? We wouldn't even exist, Lord. So we bless you, Father God, because you are everything to us, Father God, and you are everything for us, Father God, and nobody can fill the void like you can, Lord. So we praise and honor you on this day, Father God, and we say thank you, Lord. We bless your name. We say hallelujah, Lord. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. Oh, thank you, God. You're a mighty God. You're a mighty God, Father God. And we give you all the honor, all the honor and the praise, Father God, you deserve. Oh, yes, God, we give you all honor and praise and glory, Father God. We thank you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Church of Alabama family and friends. 
We want you to come on and lift your voices. Hallelujah. Lift your hands. Hallelujah. And give the Lord a shout. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many know that we serve a great God, a mighty God, a faithful God, a holy God? Come on and give him some praise. Great God, great God, you are. You are great. great forever great god great god you are you are great forever great god great god oh, oh. you are great forever great god great god oh, oh. you are great tell me say oh, oh. god we bless your name Strongholds are broken, strongholds are broken, 
Cause they're broken I am living by faith Nothing is impossible Hallelujah, nothing's impossible with God Nothing is impossible I'm not gonna live I'm not gonna live by what I see I'm not gonna live I'm not gonna live by what I feel Deep down, deep down I know that you're here with me I know, I know you that can You can do anything Through you, through you I can do anything I can, I can do all things But it's you who gives me strength Nothing is impossible for you. For you. Blind eyes are open. Strongholds are broken. I am living by faith. Nothing. Nothing is impossible. Hallelujah. How many you know that God can do all things? Nothing is impossible. Hallelujah. He can turn your situation around. Lord, I believe it. I believe. I believe. I believe. Cause it's you who gives me strength Nothing, nothing is impossible for you, for you. Blind eyes are open Strongholds are broken I am living by faith Nothing, nothing is impossible I believe, I believe 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 I believe, 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 I believe in you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Father. We bless you this morning. We give you all the glory, honor, and the praise. Oh God, we honor you this morning. We thank you and we praise you, oh God, that there is no other name than the name of Jesus. There is only one name. There is only one name with power to save. With power to save. There is only one name. There is only one name. There is only one name. Power to say. Power to say. Power to say. Power to say. Our God is champion. He reigns forevermore, forevermore. Sing our God, our God is champion. He reigns, he reigns forevermore. forevermore. Every time we'll confess, every time we'll confess that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, you are Lord, you are Lord. Sing our God, our God, He's champion, He's champion, He reigns forevermore. 
situation every circumstance and father we look unto you from with cometh all of our help oh god all of our help father it comes from you and we bless you this morning we thank you oh god to you be all the glory honor and praise in jesus name amen hallelujah Good morning, good morning, Bridge Church of Alabama family. Good morning. Oh, I am blessed to be here. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen, amen. Oh, Father God, we just thank you for this time in your presence, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, good morning. I'm here to welcome everyone out there that's tuning in, whether you're here in, in person or tuning in through our live stream. We just want to say welcome, welcome, welcome. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. We know that you could have tuned in anywhere else, 
But we thank God that he directed you here. And I know that if he directed you here, he directed you here for a purpose. And you will get what you came for. Amen. 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 I have a few announcements for our Bridge Church family. Um, Just a reminder about our prayer call uh, on our Google Meet every Wednesday morning at 6 a.m. If you would like to uh, join in, go to Google. uh, I mean, go to, I'm sorry. (laughs) Go to Bridge Church. Uh, of al.com and go to our event uh, calendar for the link and if you click on that link it'll take you right on into our google meet amen amen Amen. also we would like to recognize our birthdays for september our september birthdays we want to say a big blessed happy birthday to miss margaret sanford as well as our brother desmond peacock senior (laughs) and also last but definitely not least we would like to say happy birthday to our first lady Latrella Nolan amen amen also also let's not forget about Wednesday night Bible study every Wednesday at 6 30 p.m. join right here on Facebook live as well um, in, at, uh, every Wednesday, like I said, at 630, you will be blessed. I promise you won't, you won't miss the time that you spend with us. Amen. 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 Also for our women, where are our women? One more time. Woo, 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 woo. All right. Listen up, ladies. We have our last women's Bible study this Saturday. Jesus over everything. Amen. It has been a true blessing going through this study i mean i'm telling you it is open it is open please 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 make the time to join us this saturday it'll start at 11 a.m central time reminding that all these times are central standard time amen so if you're on the east coast if it's uh it says six it'll be at uh seven your time if it says 6 30 it'll be 7 30 your time if it says 11 a.m it'll be 12 p.m your time amen but this Saturday, ladies, come on, join us in. Also, if you would like to join us, go to our um, uh, bridgechurchofal.com website as well and click on the event link uh, for that Saturday, and it'll give you the link to link in with us. Please, please, if you can, join. Join. I, I promise you. I promise you. I promise you. It is a good one, and I'm looking forward to it. Amen? Amen. Well, it is. It is. Because it begins to open you and get your spirit ready for what's about to come. And then God, you know, with me a lot of times, God will just start telling me some things uh, to do. So uh, what I want to do is, uh, you know, we call this the prosperity message, and we know that God wants his body to prosper. And uh, I looked up the word prosper, and it's a state or condition of success, being successful. It means progress. You know what I'm saying? We're not staying in the same spot. We're moving on. Whether it's financial, whether it, you know, let's have to be financial now, but what, in whatever area we're in, if you're in school, you ought to be prospering in school. If you're working, you should be prospering on your job. So in any area of life, God wants us to prosper. Now, one of the things, God sets certain things in order. And in, God has a thing that he calls seed time and harvest. Okay, now you always have to plant a seed. And there's a saying that we picked up in the, if we used to be called the word of faith or the name and acclaimment bunch. And that is that it, every seed, a seed will, need every, uh, will meet every need. So wherever there's a need in your life, then you need to plant a seed for that. Okay, if you need love, then you plant love. Whatever it is you need, you plant, because every seed produces after its kind. And um, so what I want to do, let's, um, let's go, I'm just going to go, let's go to 1 Kings, and I'm going to look at um, 17, and I'm going to read verses 18 to, uh, through um, 15, I believe. I'll see. I think this is closer for me. I'm going to read from over this. Which one is closer? It's not closer, to what? It's not closer Carlos. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> oh, God. Let me walk up this way then. Okay. And um, now I'm going to have to read from this. I'm going to read from this one. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to read from this. <laughs> okay. And he said unto Elijah, What have I to do with the old man of God? Man of God, art thou come unto me to, wait a minute, and, and call, no, that's not the one I wanted to do. Um, is that not the one where I want to go? What did I say, first kings or second kings? Second kings, I'm sorry. That's, I know something wasn't right. <laughs> oh, this is one about the widow and the, and the mite, so we're going to just read this one through, but 
Okay. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and uh, removed them out of, this, out of his sight that none was left but the tribe of Judah only. And that is not, I don't know what I'm reading, but. Okay, go ahead. Okay. I know this is Kings. Now, what am I doing? Oh, verse 8. Okay, I can see what it is. Verses 8 to 15. I'm sorry. Mm hmm. Second Kings 17, verse 8 to 15. That's where I'm going. Well, something's wrong. I knew something went right. <laughs> okay, but you know, you guys have heard the story, but I wanted one part of it that I really want you to see. So let's go to uh, 2 Kings 17. Okay. That's not the same thing. It's still not coming out right. Okay, well, I'll just tell you about it because I don't know what I, I, I know it has this 2 Kings about the widow in the, um, and the, the widow that was, uh, it was in the time of famine. Okay, which we can relate to now because it is, we're kind of, in a sense, going through a time of famine because a lot of us can't work. Okay, and he came to the widow and he met her. She was out, uh, out there trying to uh, get some water or something to make her last little cake. So he asked her, he said, uh, and she said, uh, woman of God, and he asked her what she was doing. She said, I'm out here to make this last little cake for me and my son. I'm going to eat it and die. Okay, but uh, he said, let me tell you what, let me, I'm, I'm putting this in today's language or my language, whatever. And he said, okay, wait a minute. He said, do that. But he said, but make the cake. He said, but give me a cake first. Give it to me first. Okay. First to me. What I hear first when it comes to giving, I hear first fruit. Okay. So he said, give it me uh, uh, to eat first. So, but he told her, don't be afraid. That's the other thing. When you're about ready to give, you don't have to give. You're about to give your last. God says, fear not. I'm with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. So God is there. So that, the thing is, don't fear now this time of famine, this time that we're going through. Do not be afraid. His angels are encamped around and about you, deliver you from every evil work. Just walk this word out like you've always walked it out. Because Satan is here to distract you from what you're supposed to be doing. Okay? What you know to do. So he gave her. She did what the man told her. And she listened to her prophet. And a prophet had told her, you're not going to run out of oil. So throughout this whole famine, she, she was able to feed her family. So through this whole thing, I, it, a little personal testimony here. I seem to be doing better now that I'm going through this than I was before I was going through this. For this pandemic where you can't get out. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of times we're doing foolish things. We're going out there spending money that we won't have to. You know, we want this person we got to have. Yeah. A pair of shoes that we got to have. Yeah. But now they want you to do some things that you, you don't want to you don't want to put on a mask. You, you know, you got other things you got to do now with your money. But I'm just saying, time to sit back and fear. Well, what I'm saying, but understand when you're giving, don't be afraid. Step out in faith. That's, I mean, that said, a lady said a long time ago, she said, you've got to step out in faith with nothing underneath you but the word of God. That's all you got to hold on to. That's the only thing that's sure in this. Oh, thank you. That's the only thing that's sure in this life. That's the only thing that's sure is the word of God. Because, you know, the weather's changing. People are saying one thing today and something else tomorrow. They're concerned. That, he said, cast all your cares on me, for I care for you. Who do you trust in? Do you, are you trusted in that job or are you trusted in God? See, this is the time we're finding out these things. This is, we're finding out these things now. See, God put us in a place where we'll see where we are. So sometimes pastors have been talking about taking inventory. You need to take inventory on your faith. Yeah. You better see where you are faith-wise. So, you know, because all this, a pastor giving you a whole lot of things that we need to do. But if you're in the body of Christ, it's going to work by faith. It's got to, it works by faith. Because without it, God said, so you can't even please me. Okay, so what, what, what I'm saying to you, God has always been God's desire to pros prosperous people. God is always, but he's always required you to do something. So, I mean, he's never, I mean, every time God says, he said, give, and it'll be given to you how? Good measure, press down, shaking together, running over. Okay, so, I mean, God always gives you more than you give. He does, he does. He's an abundant God. He loves to prosper his children. He loves. So, I'm saying to you, as you get your uh, offering together, sow it in faith. Sow it without fear. Trust God. I mean, these are things that we've heard all our lives, but now is the time that God is putting us to the test. And if you fail the test, don't, be, don't worry about it. Just get up and try again. You know, a little baby, a little baby, when they're walking, when they're learning to walk, how many 
many times do they fall? Several times. But you know what? Give them a minute, they cry to get their attention, and then what do they do? Get right back up and start over again. So I'm saying, let's be like that baby. Keep it in mind. Yeah, you're going to fall. I'm almost going to tell you, I'm gonna pretty much, you're pretty much going to fall at some point in life. But have enough sense as that little baby to get up and try it again. And I guarantee you, God will strengthen you because every time you fall, you get a little stronger. In case you didn't know it, every time you get up, you're a little stronger. So just keep on, and God is going to bring you out. So whatever you're going through. So we'll get your offerings ready. Now we have a number that you can text it to. Text is 84321. Or, again, you can go to bridgechurchofal.com of of <laughs> and, and go to, the, and go to uh, you know, click on there, and it'll, uh, uh, the, the uh, what do you call them? The icons, they'll teach you where to go. They'll tell you where to go. Just <laughs> I'm, trying, trying, I'm trying to get this technical uh, speech uh, talk together, but you guys know what I mean. Just th- think of me as your grandmother, okay? <laughs> but, uh, okay. But, all right, let's get it together. And if you have it together, what I'm going to do, even if you're sitting in your homes, I'm going to ask you to lift it up as though you were laying it at his feet. I, that's, how, I, that's always I like to think of it because that was the way they honored kings back in the day. You know, you lay things at, your, at his feet and, you know, in, in saying essence that I'm in, subject, subject, in subjection to you. So it's a, it's a, it's a thing of, of respect for who he is and what he's done. Okay, Father, as we lay this at your feet, I give you glory, give you honor, give you praise and thanksgiving. Father, I thank you that your word, through the teaching, Father, is always, we know that there's a seed that will meet every need. Father, I pray that each person, whatever that need is, Father, that at this time they declare what that need is, and knowing that that need will be met. And for those, Father, for those that don't have it to give, Father, as they just give you your faith and their trust, I believe that you'll provide, you say you'll provide seed for the sower, Father God. I thank you and I praise you, Lord God. I thank you, Father, I come against any spirits of fear, I come against the enemy. Father would try to steal the harvest. I just thank you and I praise you, Father God. I thank you that your hand is on this offering, Father, for good. And every person, Father, will receive the good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over blessing in their lives. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. God bless you. Welcome, Bridge Church of Alabama, my friends and my family that are out there. We bless the Lord for you. Thank you so much for joining us on this wonderful Sunday morning. Uh, I believe, as the Bible has declared, that this is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I rejoice because I woke up this morning, and not, not just, and I didn't just wake up, but I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on the Lord. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Had to get that out of my spirit right there. Actually, I didn't get it out of my spirit. I just had to let you know what was in my spirit right there. And I don't want to get it out. I want to continue to celebrate the Lord on today. Amen. Bless you all. We had a wonderful weekend this past weekend thus far. Our men had a, a, a time. I didn't hear an announcement. You know, sometimes they be kind of holding back on what the men do. But the men had our Google Meet this Friday. Amen. Whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> And we had a wonderful time. You know, we had a, uh, we had some uh, uh, a wonderful opportunity to sow into one another and to uh, 
break bread with one another, spiritually break bread with one, with one another. And so we're, 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 we're doing it, man. That's all. What can I say? We're doing it. We're doing exactly you know what God is orchestrating in our lives to do? We, we saw an opportunity for iron to sharpen iron on Friday night, and our men are growing. <clears throat> and I will just continue to encourage you all um, that did not have an opportunity to join us on this past Friday night. We're in the middle of a series, um, and that series is called The Making of a Man. And if you have an opportunity, we're going to be doing this every two weeks. And so two weeks from, from this past Friday, I uh, believe it's the, what is it, October the 5th or 2nd? Up to, October the 2nd, we'll be doing it again, uh, following up in the series, going into uh, lesson number two. And so, uh, again, that information will be placed on. If it's not already there, it's probably already there because I know how uh, the co operates. Uh, it's on our calendar uh, under events, and so <laughs> we can uh, take care. You can go there and, and see exactly uh, what our lessons will be, and it, there's a link there for you to join us uh, for the Google Meet. I'd love to have you all partake in that. Uh, and I mean, really, you think about it, it's, it's, it's a matter of you sit, you don't have to leave your home or you can be in the parking lot. It's just so, com it's, it's a place of comfort where you can join the men and you also have an opportunity to, to share what, what's on your heart. And I also believe that you're going to learn some things. Uh, one of the things that I tell people is that you'll be surprised what come out of your own mouth when you join, you know, a, a setting with men like that. You'll be surprised what comes out your own mouth. You think about it later on that night, you'll be like, man, did I say that? <laughs> did that come out of me? Yes, it came out of you, but it came out of you just the right time where God needed someone else to hear what it is that was in, that, that he had placed in your bosom. Amen? Amen. So we're, 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 we're having a wonderful, uh, wonderful time. I, I want to get into the word this morning. Uh, don't want to give you a whole lot or go back over a lot of stuff. Uh, but I, I just still believe that this series that we're in, God is really blessing it. And each week, I believe God is just adding more and more uh, to, uh, to, to, to the lesson. And, and I just want to get it all out, man. Sometimes, you know, I talk so fast, I've been trying to get it all out because I'm so full. And God has really blessed me on this weekend uh, in, this, in this one area that we're going to be talking about. Uh, today. And so if you're prepared, like I've always told you, if you have an opportunity to, you know, get you a pad and some pencil or paper, pad, pencil, paper, and begin to take some notes. Because what I do want you to do is I want you to go back and, and, and look back on this lesson and, and study it for yourself. Uh, I don't want this to be just common where you just come in, you check in, you know, you, you heard a couple of good words and then you, you, you walk away and, and leave it. The, the Bible talks about that. It says that when, when, when you get the word, if it's, if it's, if it's not planted in the, in the right soil and planted properly, uh, then they said that the birds of the air are coming and, and steal it or the ground won't receive it. Or, you know, this, there's different uh, uh, instances of what will happen to the word if it's not uh, cared for properly and, and, and bosomed properly. So I want you to write these things down. I want you to take some good notes and I want you to go back and study what we're learning this week uh, in reference to uh, our, our lesson. But before we go forward, I, of course, I need to go before the throne of grace and I ask that you join me as we go before God. Father, your name is to be praised above all names. We bless you. We render ourselves to you as just a vessel, and prayerfully, Father, you see us as a vessel of honor, God, that we'll be in a place, in a position today where we're able to deliver your word, and as we deliver your word, that it will glorify you. We hold back ourselves, God. We release ourselves into your will. We tell you to have full course today, have full uh, control of my mouth, of my tongue, of my consciousness, of my heart. Father, it all belongs to you in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray now, God, for the hearers of your word, Father, that they are in a place, in a position, in a posture to receive from you today. We bless you, Father, for the results, Lord God, and we may not see the results immediately, and that's okay, God. We know that sometimes Sometimes it takes time, God, for, for, for things to grow and for us to see uh, the presence of uh, the manifestation of it coming up out of the ground. But we do believe, God, that you are planting a seed in the hearts of your people today and that in due season, God, it shall manifest. We thank you for it now today and it's in your glorious name we pray. Amen. 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 Bless the Lord. Well, we've been uh, in, in, in a lesson 
uh, over the last several weeks, I, I've been teaching on it's time to take inventory. It's time to take inventory. And for those of you that are joining us for the very first time, uh, uh, um, this, is, this has been a series. I, I don't even know what week we're in. I think this may be week four, week five. Uh, but over the last several weeks, we've been taking inventory in particular areas of our lives. And we're doing this because we believe that it is, it, it is in our best interest as children of God, to do so if you want to receive God's very best. It is in your, my, our best interest to take an inventory of our lives. Uh, I know I want God's very best. I don't know about you, but do you want God's very best for your life? I want God's very best. And yes, I know I want God's very best for my life, but I realize also that I cannot have his best if I'm not allowed to be in his presence. I, I cannot have God's very best if I'm not allowed to be in his presence. Let's go to Psalms chapter 16, verse 11. Psalms chapter 16, verse 11 in the King James Version. I want to be in the presence of the Lord. What does it say? Uh, Psalms chapter 16, verse 11 says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy, my God. And at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. I want to be in God's presence because in his presence, there's fullness of joy. And in his right hand, there's pleasures forevermore. We cannot, we cannot indulge in these pleasures and we're not allowed in his presence. <laughs> we cannot indulge in these pleasures if we're not allowed in his presence. And sin keeps us out of God's presence. And that's according to Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1. Let's go there real quick. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1 in the NIV version. It says, surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities, which is sin, wickedness, violations of God's will and purpose, have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you. I, I, I don't want my sin to separate me from God, so therefore I don't want sin in my life. When sin is in my life, it separates me from God. And I know that if, if I'm separated from God, then I am just might as well just die. It's over. Life is over with because there is no life without him. And so to avoid, um, the, the, uh, to avoid having sin in our presence or having uh, sin take full control of our lives, th there are certain things that we have to do. We have to perform what we call a periodic assessment of our lives. There, there's times that you have to take a pause. I say take a pause for the cause or take a pause for the cause. Take some time out for yourself and do an evaluation and inventory of what's going on in your life. Well, over the last several weeks, we have declared that there are certain things or certain areas in our lives that we thought, well, I believe the Lord has given to me as most important areas in our lives that we need to take inventory to. Those, er those areas are attitudes. We want to take an, an assessment, make an assessment of your attitude. We want to make an assessment of your behaviors. How do you behave? Take uh, an assessment of possessions, your, your possessions, those things that God has blessed you with and made you store it over. Uh, take uh, an inventory of your habits. What are those things that you do frequently and you do them, don't even realize you're doing them? Your habits. And then what are the things, uh, uh, what, are, what are the relationships? Let's take an inventory of the relationships that you have. Those that you have that are, that are, that are present in your life, are they meaningful? What are they sowing into your life? What are, they, are they producing anything in your life? And you want, we want to take those items, I think it was, what is it, a total of five? We want to take those items and you want, to, you want to put those things under a microscope. You want to look real deep into those things and put them up under a microscope. Under a microscope. It is in these areas that we will find sin trying to manifest its dominion over our life. And if we're not careful, we'll, we'll never see it coming. And by the time it's recognizable, the damage has been done. If we don't take the time out to do this, Satan will sneak in, and by the time we realize it, the damage has been done. Well, what is the damage? What, what's, what's the damage that, that, that we're talking about? Well, that damage is what we talked about earlier, that separation from God. That's what sin will do. It, we, when sin comes in, it separates us from God. That's the damage. And if we don't take the time to do a righteous inventory, listen now, key word in that is righteous inventory, righteous meaning inventories by God's standards and not by our own and not by someone else's, but we're doing an inventory based on what God's standards is. 
If we fail to do this type of inventory, Satan will blind us into thinking and believing there's nothing wrong with us or the way we're living. He'll blind us. The Bible says that he'll blind the, the, the eyes and the minds of, of, of people. And, and what happens is when he blinds us, we'll find ourselves in complete denial. Let's go to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 in the NLT version. 1 John chapter 1. Verse 8, and we're going to read verse 8 through 10. First John chapter 1, verse 8 through 10 says this, says, If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and, show, and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. Satan will get you in a position where you begin to deny even the things that you're doing and make you think that the things you're doing that are wrong are right. You begin to feel good about it. You begin to have a consciousness of feeling like it's okay. It's all right. Let's go to 2 Corinthians, and I'm building a case today. I just want to build a case because I want to, I'm trying to build a, a case that you understand why this, this lesson is so important and why an inventory of your lives is so important. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13 in the Message Bible, beginning with the fifth, fifth verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, I mean 13, uh, uh, beginning with uh, verse number 5, verse number 5. It says this, it says, test yourselves to make sure you are solid in faith, in the faith. Don't drift along, taking everything for granted. Give yourselves, listen to this, give yourselves regular checkups. Come on. He said, give yourself regular checkups. Don't, don't wait on someone else to do it. Give yourselves regular checkups. You need firsthand speed for those that are joining us. The main purpose of a self-imposed inventory is to discover the things in our life that needs to be kept because they add fruit or those things that need to be thrown away because they cause detriment or stunts our spiritual growth. Let's look at our foundational scriptures. We want to go to our foundational scriptures. These are my supportive scriptures of why this lesson uh, even, even uh, exists. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 40. Lamentations in the Message Bible. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 40. It says this, it says, let's take a good look at the way we're living and reorder our lives under God. Let's take a good look at the way we're living and reorder our steps under God. Let's go to Haggai chapter 1, verses 5 through 7 in the NIV version. Haggai chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. It says, now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your field. You put on clothes but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. He says, give careful thought to your ways. Give careful thought to your ways. And then Romans chapter 14 verse 12 in the NIV version says, So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Romans chapter 14 verse 12. He said we're going to give an account, each and every one of us. Not to, 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 to my mother, not to my father, not to my brother, my sister, but I'm going to give account to God himself. And so as we move forward in this lesson, we talked about there are five areas that, we're, that we believe need, we need to take inventory of. And, and these five areas, they are not all inclusive, meaning don't stop there, but these are just five areas that, 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 that I believe the Holy Spirit has spoke to me. These five areas are just starters and in pushing us into, into a, a, a greater place where God can use us and that we will be blessed even more so. Uh, I think it was Wednesday night I talked about how we sometimes assume uh, that the blessing of the Lord is only for for him, but the blessing of the Lord, it blesses him. But when we bless the Lord, the Lord turns it right back around and he blesses us. And so the blessing is not just for, uh, just for God, but the blessing is for you as well. So, but our, our motive should always be to bless God, knowing that if we bless God, he's going to turn around and bless us. And so these are areas in our lives that we're going to take, that we've been taking an inventory. Uh, these are five, uh, five areas we've been talking about time inventory, spiritual inventory, Personal inventory, relationship inventory, and financial inventory. 
Time, spiritual, personal, relationship, and financial. Now, we spent some time talking about time inventory. We said that time inventory and the sum time inventory up. We said that where you spend your minutes, that's where your priorities are. Bottom line, where you spend your minutes, that's where your priorities are. Then we went into the spiritual inventory, spiritual inventory. And then the spiritual inventory, I got a, uh, uh, we had a, a, a few sub uh, uh, topics under spiritual inventory. Uh, we started off talking about avoiding, avoid comparisons, avoid comparisons prevents us when we avoid comp uh, comparisons. It prevents us from progression or when we when we do compare. It, it prevents us from progressing in the direction God has laid out for us when we do compare. We don't want to compare ourselves to other people. When you compare yourselves to others, you are focusing on the wrong things. Comparison can give you a false sense of inferiority or superiority. It gives you the false sense of superiority or inferiority. You, sometimes you'll make, you, you, when you compare yourself, you begin to feel like you're not enough. That's a sense of inferiority. Or there are times when you compare yourself, you think you got it all and you better than somebody else. That's superiority. We don't want that. God didn't call you to run someone else's race. We are to run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. And this is according to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, who, who is the author and finisher of our faith. And so we want to fix our eyes on Jesus because Jesus has set a course for us. And that's, that's what we want to do. We want to follow his course. And what we want to do also when it comes down to not comparing ourselves is that we want to find ourselves always celebrating what God is doing in those, of, uh, those lives around us. Instead of comparing their lives to, to ours, we want to celebrate their lives. Focusing on Christ and giving him glory in all things is the best way to stay free from jealousy and pride. Focusing on what God is doing and celebrating our brothers and our sisters as they get promoted. Celebrating when they get a brand new car, a brand new house. Celebrating when a newborn uh, is born into their, their family. Celebrating. Stop talking about how they're going to afford this. How they're going to do this. How they're going to do that. Man, celebrate them. Thank God for them. Because what happens is when you get in this place of comparing, you also get in a place of jealousy and pride. And jealousy and pride is, a, is, a de is demonic spirits. And that's a whole nother lesson in itself. But jealousy and pride are demonic spirits. And you want to stay away from that. So celebrate your brothers and your sisters. And then we went on and we talked about learning how to forgive. Forgiveness. And again, this is, these are all subtopics under, under uh, spiritual inventory. Learning how to forgive. One of the things that I didn't go in detail a whole lot about was not, learning how to, not just learning how to forgive other people, but also learning how to forgive yourself. Learning how to let go and forgive yourself. Some of us are stuck in that. We can't even move forward because we haven't learned how to forgive ourselves. Uh, forgiveness doesn't require agreeing with what the person, who, what the person did uh, who hurt you. It, does, it doesn't mean you agree with them. No, it doesn't. Unforgiveness is a reminder of what someone did to you. Forgiveness is a reminder of what God did for you got to remember what it is that God did for me. And when I remember what God did for me, then it helps me to forget what someone has done for me, what they have done to me. Forgiveness is super spiritual because it's, it, it goes beyond what you feel. See, when, it's hard to forgive somebody as long as you keep on concentrating on how you feel. And, and that's why forgiveness is really supernatural. It's, it's a spiritual thing because you have to, you really got to have some God in you. And sometimes, you know, the hurt is so bad, it requires the presence of the Lord in you, in you to, to, to forgive that person. And again, forgiving them does not mean that you, that you agree with them. All it simply means is that I'm, I'm moving forward. And even though the pain may still exist, I'm moving forward, and I'm trusting and believing God by faith that as time goes on, the pain will subside. And that's my belief. And as, and, 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 and as I speak to you today, I'm a living witness, and most of you know that, that, that there are times that things you have been hurt in your life. And, and those that have allowed God to come in and fix it, you know that as time goes by, the, the pain subsides. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to realize that. We must show the world Christianity, Christianity really works by forgiving others the way Christ forgave us. Got to show the world that. We got to show the world. We are the example. The Bible calls us ambassadors. We are an example here on the earth of what Christ looks like and, and how to live before him. And so this is what God expects expect us to do. Then we went in and we talked about holiness. 
Holiness, how do you define holiness? What does it look like to you? What does holiness look like to you? Because the Bible says, be ye holy for I am holy. That's 1 Peter 1 and 16. Holiness is a daily choice. You have to choose if you want to protect what is most valuable, what is most sacred and special in your life. And that should be your relationship with God. When we talk about holiness, we're talking about your relationship with God. How do you see holiness? It's all about your relationship with God. The deeper your relationship, the more intimate your relationship is with God, the, 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 the greater the understanding you understand what holiness is. And you get to understand that holiness is not about being perfect. See, the devil will have you thinking that holiness is about being perfect. And that's what he has, that's what he has, he has placed in the churches, that, that, that if you're not perfect, then you ain't saved. If you ain't perfect, then you ain't holy. No, that's not what holiness is. Holiness is about living up to God's standards to the best of your ability and allowing him to do the work which is in progress. A work which is in progress. We're always work in progress. We all know that God has given each of us the gift of freedom or freedom of choice, or freedom of free will, that gift allows us to experience certain freedoms. Some of those freedoms are detrimental to our lives, both naturally and spiritually. To be holy, we have to be willing to get rid of anything, even things that our freedom allows that stands in between us and God. So even though that, that, that God has given us the ability to do all things, you don't have to do them. Everything that you do, it may seem right, but it may not be the right time to do them. It may seem right, but it ain't for you to do. So we have to understand that. So holiness is just living up to God's standards. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23 in the New Living Translation. This is Paul talking, and Paul says this. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23 in the New Living um, uh, NIV version. NIV version says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to... To, to do anything, but not everything is constructive, meaning that there are things that are available for me to do, but I don't have to do them. You don't have to do them. Then we went on and we talked about biblical conviction. This is where we ended up last week. Now, biblical conviction, man, this is where uh, some people say, I, I, I'm stepping on your toes. Well, I, I, I don't mind stepping on your toes if it's going to cause a change, but stepping on your toes ain't enough. I want there to be a change. So we're talking about biblical conviction and biblical conviction is a lot is an is an area that we've been spending some time on and i really believe that god really still wants us to to to, to hear this word one of the most revealing things about our spiritual growth and our heart is how do we respond to conviction how do you respond to conviction how do you and i respond to conviction well let's 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 def define conviction and i i said this last week i said the first thing that we in defining conviction is defining what conviction is not. Conviction is not condemnation. Conviction is not condemnation. Condemnation will have your guilt turn against you. Guilt then becomes your enemy. And how do we respond to enemies? We respond to enemies by, by fighting against it. We respond to enemies by hiding from it. We respond to our enemies by resisting the presence of it. We must understand that guilt is not our enemy. Guilt is the acknowledgement with remorse now, the acknowledgement with remorse of responsibility of some offense, some crime, or some wrongdoing that we may have done. It's just taking responsibility for it. Let me share with you, and you probably already know this, but for those of you who don't, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me uh, uh, expose some things uh, to you today. The number one tool that the enemy uses to keep Christians down and keep sinners the same is guilt. The number one thing that he uses is guilt. He, it keeps, it keeps uh, Christians down and, and, and it, it, it keeps Satan, uh, uh, keeps sinners wanting to remain the same. It's guilt. And what happens? I just told you guilt, if not used properly, if not seen properly, if not having the proper perspective of guilt, guilt can be turned around and used negatively. And, and, and that's what Satan does. He's taking things that God has placed in our lives and he's twisted it so that we can see the opposite of it and, and respond to it negatively. Guilt is not your enemy. Guilt is a tool that can be used that God uses in order for us to move forward. Guilt. Let me tell you what happens when an enemy uses guilt in our lives. When guilt is used in our lives, guilt leads to shame. Shame is painful, powerful emotion caused by a consciousness of guilt or a shortcoming. I'll say that again. Shame is a, pa a painful, powerful emotion 
caused by a consciousness of guilt or a shortcoming. Shame is different from guilt. Shame is different from guilt. Guilt says this, I made a mistake, made a bad decision. I must confess it, take responsibility for it, and get it off my chest or my consciousness. I admit I missed the mark. I've sinned. I'm guilty. That's guilt. This is what shame says. Shame says this, I made a mistake. No, rather, rather it says, I am a mistake. Not I made a mistake, but I am a mistake. I am a mistake. I must hide it so others won't find out about it. I cannot bear someone confirming what I believe about myself, so I got to stay in hiding. You remember the story about Adam and Eve. When, when Adam and Eve sinned, they, be, they went into hiding. They became shameful. Adam said, God said, where are you? Adam, where are you? Adam said, I hid myself. Because I was ashamed, I hid myself. I was guilty, but yet I allowed shame to come in. I hid myself. Guilt is feeling bad about what you've done. It's an awareness of failure against a standard, a code of conduct, even the word of God. But right after that, I repent and move forward. Right after you realize that you've done what you've done, you just repent and move forward. Shame is seeing yourself as a failure before the eyes of God. Or seeing yourself as a failure before the, the eyes of people because of what you've done wrong. It can be an intense pain of feeling unworthy before people and even God. A pain of feeling disconnected and unlovable. Shame will take any opportunity you give, you give it to stop, hinder, block, or sabotage your future. It's a weight that that is not dealt with properly, will prevent you from becoming everything God intended you to become. That's what shame would do. When shame is in your life, fear shows up. When shame is in your life, fear shows up. And, th and this is what the, the enemy, you got to remember, the enemy will take guilt. And he'll twist it and he'll make you begin to feel bad about it and he'll begin to use it. And that guilt will lead to shame. And that's what he wants. I, I had an example in my mind and my thinking early the day that, 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 that one of the examples of, 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 of taking things and turning it around and how it can become worse. We're, we're talking about guilt. And I like to use this and I like to teach this in terms of, uh, of Christians and how we sometimes are, uh, we, we become worried about things. And the Bible tells us that worry is a sin. And I try to teach that when you, when you are concerned about certain things, the concern is okay. The concern means that I have to place a certain amount of attention to what is taking place. But when you start pulling, uh, taking all your, your attention and all your energy and you begin to start uh, 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 allowing that concern to, to, to consume you, it goes into a level of worry. And it's the same thing with guilt. Guilt, if not used properly, goes into a level of shame. Well, Concern, if not dealt with properly or not used properly, it goes into a level of worry. And when you begin to worry about things, you, it, it becomes sin. Because when, this, is the, this is the difference between uh, uh, worry and concern. Concern says this. Well, let's talk about worry. Worry says this. Oh, my God. There's a cat, cat of three, cat four, hurricane coming. Oh, we're going to die. Our house is going to be broken down. Oh, what are we going to do? Where are we going to live? We got, oh, we got all this we got to worry about. Oh, oh, my God, where are we going to go? And then you begin to worry about all these things, and these things haven't even happened yet. And you begin to speak things out of your mouth that God has not even ordained for you to say. Now, the opposite of, uh, 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 of worry is concern. Concern is this. Oh, they're forecasting the cat category four hurricane, category five hurricane. Well, bless the Lord, we must do something about it. Let's take certain processes and procedures and do what the best we can and then move and do whatever it is that we need to do. But we ain't going to worry about it because worrying ain't going to help us, not one inch or one bit. But we're going we gonna to take what we have and we're going to uh, uh, acknowledge the fact that it is there. See, concern is just an acknowledgement that there is a situation that requires my attention. That's all it is. And if it requires my attention and then I know that I do the best that I can with what I, I have available to me and the rest of it, I take it to God in prayer. I take it to the altar. That way I don't worry about it. God don't want you to worry about it. It's like saying, oh, my God, my son is out there. Oh, it's a ri they're riding out there. He's going to get shot. He's going to get shot. What are you speaking out of your mouth? Those things come out of your mouth because you have, you're, you're, you're speaking it out of worry. But 
the opposite of that is saying, my son is out there, they're riding, Lord, I'm going to put my son at the altar and I'm going to leave him there. And I, that's my concern. My concern, I'm not, my concern is, is enough to say that I still, I, I love him, I'm concerned about him, but I ain't worried about him. Why I'm not worried about him? Because I've given him over to God. And so that's just the opposite. And so that's what Satan does. He'll take your concern, he'll turn it into worry. He'll take your guilt, and he'll turn it into shame. And you've got to be conscious enough to know the difference. Conscious enough to know the difference. So often does, so, uh, how often, the question I, I had, how often does Satan use your shame against you? What is shame stopping in your life? What are the consequences of not dealing with shame? Well, when you don't deal with shame, you, you, become, you become paranoid. You begin to worry about what other people are saying, people are, what other people are thinking about you, and what they've said, and what they're saying behind closed doors. You begin, people be over in a group, and you be over here, and you thinking they're talking about you. And they could be talking about the weather, but you think about them. You become paranoid, and that's what shame would do. God don't want you to feel any shame. He don't want you to feel any guilt, uh, except for the guilt that, that causes you to go into a place of conviction. Now, we talked about that. So we said Satan uses guilt as his means of causing us to shrink back, give up, and quit. When guilt is not used properly, we begin to focus on our inadequacies. We begin to focus on our failures. We begin to focus on our mistakes. We begin to focus on our bad decisions. That's not what God wants us to do. When we focus on all those things, we get into a place of condemnation. And the Bible says in Romans chapter uh, 8, verse 1, therefore there's no condemnation to them that belong to Christ Jesus. He don't want us to be condemned. He don't want us to feel that way. He don't want us to feel that we're beaten up. The things that we've done is way, is, is, is so heavy, we can't get through it. We can't get past it. And so we defined that. We, we, I wanted to make sure that we understand what it is and how Satan uses guilt. Guilt is not your enemy. Guilt is not your enemy. Now let's talk about conviction. The word conviction is used in several different ways. And, and when we talk about conviction, it can be used in, in, in terms of uh, as, as it pertains to law. Uh, it's a declaration that someone has been made found, found guilty. Found guilty by a, by a, jur uh, what they say, a jury of their peers. Found guilty, uh, come back, your honor, they're guilty. Now the, the, the judge places a sentence on them. You do time, you're now called a convicted felon, convicted felon. And then there's, a, there, there's the, the conviction, which, which is, what, is uh, what we're talking about uh, in, in our lives is considered a strong belief. Strong belief in something. Before getting saved, we all had our own convictions about certain things. You don't realize it, but these are certain strong beliefs that you, that you had, that you believed in. Christians have a conviction that they must be led by the Holy Spirit. That, that ought to be a conviction of yours. If you're a Christian, you should have a conviction that everything I do, I need to be led by the Holy Spirit. You should be convicted in your heart. When you do something outside of the will of God, it should cause a conviction. Biblical convictions are essential for spiritual maturity and growth. Convictions are part of your character. The dictionary defines convictions as fixed or strong beliefs. Convictions can be much more than that. Your convictions include your motivations, what motivates you. Your values, what, what's inside you, what do you believe, and your commitment, what are you committed to? Convictions can be much more than that. We have convictions when we are thoroughly convinced or fully persuaded that something is true and right to do. There's uh, an author, uh, Mr. Mr. Howard Hendricks. He's also a professor, and he used to be a keynote speaker to, for the, uh, the Promise Keepers. He said this in, in, in describing conviction. He said, a belief is something you will argue about. A conviction is something you will die for. A belief is something you will argue about. But a conviction is something you will die for. And that's what we want. We want, we want to feel that conviction. We want, we, are, we want our convictions and our lives to be so strong you're willing to die for it. And that's what happened to the, the 12 disciples. I don't know if you realize this, but out of the 12 disciples... All of them, 11 of them, end up giving their lives. Their lives were taken from them because they were convicted to believe what Christ uh, uh, meant in their lives. They were convicted by the gospel. And they, they died a, a, a hard death because they were convicted that they were willing to die for what they believed. They were willing to die for it. Conviction is the work of the Holy Spirit where a person is able to see himself as God sees him. 
when the Holy Spirit comes to you and he begins to present something to you, what the Holy Spirit does is that he, 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 he shines the flashlight on what you're feeling. And that feel, that, that what you're feeling is guilt. And he, he'll, he'll shine the flashlight on it. Uh, let's, go to, let's go to John chapter 16 in the Amplified Version. John chapter 16, verse 5 through 8 in the Amplified Version. The Holy Spirit is the person who brings about conviction. John chapter 16, verse 5 through 8 says, But now I am going to, but now I, I am, this is Christ speaking. He says, But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, Where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts and taken complete possession of them. But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, standby will not come to you. But if I, but if I go, I will send him, the Holy Spirit, to you to be in close fellowship with you. And he... And he, when he comes, will convict the world about the guilt of sin and, this, and the need for a savior and about righteousness and about judgment. This is what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit comes and he brings about conviction. He brings about conviction. Conviction functions differently for the Christian opposed to the non-Christian. For the non-Christian, conviction reveals sinfulness, guilt, and brings fear of God's judgment. Whereas conviction in the believer brings an awareness of sin. It brings an awareness before you do it. That, that's the difference with, with, from a non-believer to a believer. See, a, a believer already has the Spirit of the Lord living in him. So before you can even do wrong, the Holy Spirit begins to convict you before you can do it. And you, you realize it. And it's almost, like, it's, it's, like, it's almost like he puts up a red flag in you. You begin to feel that red flag is a red flag in you, and you realize, whoa, hold on, stop. I need to stop right here. Something is not right. Something is not right. Conviction of sin brings man to the cross and shows the need for forgiveness. That's what conviction does. The word conviction, as we will be using it in, in today, is referring to the ideal or realization of your guilt as it arises in particular areas of your life. And how do we respond to it? How do you respond to conviction? When God, when the Holy Spirit convicts you, how do you respond to it? How do you respond to it? I, and I gave a, a scripture last week of Paul writing a letter in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And he wrote a letter and he said that in my letter, he said, I'm sorry that, that this letter hurts your feelings. He said, but after realizing what this letter did in terms of changing you around and changing your mindset, he said, I'm happy now. I'm happy, not so much that I hurt you, but I'm happy that the pain caused you to have godly sorrow. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 11 in the New Living Translation, and I'm going to move forward, but take notes now. I told you, go back and research that. What is your response when you are shown the errors of your ways? What is your response? How do you respond to it when the Holy Spirit brings it up and you begin to, to realize that there's something wrong or I'm doing something wrong in your life? People respond different ways when they are told, uh, 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 when, when the Holy Spirit brings these things to the life and, and the Holy Spirit re, re, uh, reveals to you that you're doing something wrong. People respond differently. Even us people of God, we respond differently. Some people get very defensive about their actions and try to find excuses for what they have done. Other people respond by comparing themselves to others. Well, at least I'm not as bad as so-and-so. At least look, I may have taken a pencil, but he took the pencil and the paper. <laughs> begin, you know, begin to measure yourself with that. You know, some people just respond by just ignoring it. They say, oh, well, you know, this, this will pass. No, the Holy Spirit don't want it to pass. He wants you to take uh, action of it. Other people are willing to admit that they're wrong and work to correct the problem with a sincere effort. And that's what happens when you take that guilt. You respond to it positively. You respond in a positive way and you work. You, you, you take it to, to the Lord in prayer and you, 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 you have a sincere effort on getting it right. Where do you fit in and, and, and all those, where do you fit in? Do, do you respond sincerely and take it to the Lord in prayer? Do you compare yourselves to other people? Uh, do you just say, well, this too will pass. I get over it. Uh, it'll be okay. Oh, they'll get over it. 
Biblical conviction is not just feeling guilty about something. There are tons of people, tons of people that feel guilty about it, but they don't do nothing about their guilt. Biblical conviction results in a change of action. That change of action is called repentance. Repentance should be the natural response to conviction over wrongdoing, but it isn't always the way people respond. When we speak about re repentance now, and I wanted to clarify this, I want to make sure that we understand. Repentance is not just saying, God, I'm sorry. Repentance goes much deeper than that. It is a total change of mind and heart and direction of life. It is a change to a new way of life. It is a turning from the self-centered way of vanity, self-centered way of selfishness, self-centered way of, 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 of how, how you feel towards authority. Uh, it, it has a lot to do with that. Repentance is just the first step. Repentance, true repentance is, number one, acknowledging the fact that I'm wrong and then turning, you, turning in the direction to do better and then doing better. It's not just talking about it, it's being about it. Not just talking about it, but being about it. When you receive conviction, it is not a time to be mad, angry, or frustrated. But it is a time to be thankful for God's patience. See, when, because what happens is when, when God has allowed the, the Holy Spirit to convict you, that's a sign of his patience with you. Because he could wipe you out just as sure as your next breath. He could wipe you out. But he, his, his grace is so uh, in, immeasurable, uh, immeasurable, that, 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 that he allows us or allows the Holy Spirit to talk to us and to reconcile with us. The Bible says, come let us reason together, save the Lord. Come let us reason together. I think that's Isaiah chapter 1, what, verse 18. Come let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, he said, I will make them white as snow. He said, let's reason together. He allowed the Holy Spirit to come in and reason. You, you can reason with the Holy Spirit. And God doesn't have to allow that to happen. He doesn't allow you. To, he doesn't. He doesn't have to uh, uh, apply any grace in our lives. He can, he can just wipe us out. And, and there are many stories in the Bible how God's grace was sufficient, sufficient. And if you look back on our lives, you look back on your life. I look back on mine. I mean, His grace has been more than sufficient, more than sufficient, man. Man, I'm talking about being in, a, being, a, being in the midst of sin, carrying on in the middle of it, knowing I'm wrong. And God's grace still allowed me to get through the sin and then come out of it and st still find time to go back and repent. My God, man. I, I don't know any human being that would give me that kind of grace to allow me to sin right in front of them, to allow me to punish them or sin right in front of them, and then allow me to come right there while they're, while they're watching my sin, watch me hurt them, and then allow me to come right moments right after and say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hurt you. Come on, man. How many times have I gone to God and said, God, I I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do it. I'm a straight out lie. I didn't mean to do it. I didn't mean to do it. The honest part, the, 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 the fact of the matter is I meant to do it, but God, I, 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 I do mean to do better, though. I want to do better. We were talking about, oh, well, I was reading about the story of David in 2 Samuel chapter 12, and you can go and read this. I'll give it to you just for a reference. 2 Samuel chapter 12, um, verses 1 through 13. Uh, the prophet Nathan came to David. Some of you, are, a lot of you are familiar with the story of David and how David uh, uh, stole uh, Bathsheba uh, from, 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 from uh, one of uh, um, uh, David's captains. Well, after David sinned with Bathsheba, the prophet Nathan came to David with a message from God. He first told David a story. He told him a rich man who owned a very large number of sheep and cattle and of a poor, and of a poor man who owned one lamb. The poor man loved this lamb immensely. One day a traveler came and instead of feeding the man on one of his lambs, the rich man took the lamb from the poor man. David was angry at what he heard and even suggested that the man deserved to die for what he did and pay back four times as much. Then Nathan told David that he was that man in a sense. He had taken what was not his he had sinned. He had sinned. David was broken over his sin. It was after this confrontation that he wrote Psalms chapter 51. David had, had got to a place where he, wouldn't, he didn't feel guilty about the sin that he did. 
felt he was, he was so convinced that what he did was okay that when Nathan came and gave him a story, he didn't, he didn't, he, he didn't even rec recognize how devastating his own sin was. And then Nathan, the prophet, had to tell him, hey, man, you realize that was you. That was you. And when that conviction hit David, the Bible says that he went on and he, and he, he wrote Psalms chapter 51. Let's go there. Psalms chapter 51, verse 1 through 14. We got a little time. Come on, let's do this. Psalms chapter 51, verse 1 through 14. You got to, you got to hear this. Because I, I can't imagine what would have happened if that confrontation would have never happened in David's life. It changed him. That confrontation changed him. Him feeling guilty would have never happened. Let's go to Psalm chapter 51, verse 14. I might even have it here. There we go. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of <clears throat> your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. See, this is, that's, that's repentance right there, coming to God with a broken heart. Not just coming to him with a bunch of excuses. Oh, God, this woman you gave me, and that's why I sinned. No, oh God, the reason why I've sinned is because uh, uh, I didn't have enough money and so I had to steal the loaf of bread. God don't want to hear that. He don't want to hear all that. Uh, he wants us to come to him with a broken and contrite heart. Next verse. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will, hold on now, we jump, we jump, we jump. Start with verse 1. We, we, we went far, verse 1, go to verse 1. Psalm chapter 51, verse 1. Okay, yeah, there we go. Well, I start off too fast. For the director of music, Psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had, here we go, committed adultery with Bathsheba, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Okay, here we go. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Come on. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me against you. And you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Come on now. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the wound. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart. Come on, somebody. Oh, God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Hmm. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your, your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Come on, somebody. One more verse. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed. Oh, God, you who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. David, when David realized his sin, man, he went to God and he said, God, I am nothing without you. Please don't take your presence away from me. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me because it is your Holy Spirit that keeps me on this right track that I'm on. I need your Holy Spirit. I need you, and I need you to cleanse me. I need you to put the right spirit within me. Cleanse me, oh God. Cleanse my heart. Renew the right spirit within me. That's repentance when you go before the Lord. I said this last week. God does not, I said it this morning. God does not expect us to be perfect. Holiness does not mean perfected, per, per, perfected. Perfection. Thank you, First Lady. Holiness does not mean perfection. Holiness means that I am striving every day to be more and more like God. But I am work in progress. Work in progress. The reference for the story is 2 Sam, 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. 
It's actually, it's actually that whole chapter. So, so 2 Samuel chapter 12 is the whole chapter talks about it because what happens after that, the Bible goes in and starts talking about what God started doing in terms of, 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 of punishment for David. Now, just because you repent, I, guess I get, thank you for that, First Lady, because I need to cleanse this up. Just because you repent does not mean that there are not going to be some circumstances that you got to deal with. There's, there's some things now that, that your sin has caused a, a, a reaction to. Your action causes a reaction. And God is not going to allow you to get away with every sin that you do just because you come back to him and say, give me a clean heart. David had to suffer some consequences. But by, even though he repented, he still had to suffer some consequences. A child of his was, had died. Uh, a, a, a son of his uh, what raped his stepsister. I mean, so many things happened in David's life. The Bible says so many things that happened in David's life. David went into fasting. He went into fasting and still prayed and asked God, God, please take this off of me. Please release it. Change it around. God still had to allow those things to happen because even in your sin, even by repenting, you're still going to have to suffer some consequences. And sometimes it's those consequences that make you want to stay in the right road to, toward salvation. Because it, it, when you realize the pain that, that God allowed you to suffer through, you realize you don't want to go back there anymore. I know me personally. I don't want to go back and, and deal with the pain that I had to deal with based on the consequences uh, that, my, that my, my sin rend, rendered. And it didn't just render, not just rendered under me, but how it rendered under the other people, my loved ones. Amen. Amen. My God, my God. Ooh, where we at? Where are we? Where are we? Where are we? Conviction without a response towards repentance and change is pointless. Conviction without a response towards repentance and change is pointless. What good is it for you to be convicted, but if you ain't going to turn, turn the thing around and allow God to fix it? And even though, this is the thing now, you, you can sin, there are going to be some consequences to your sin. Now, you can, you can try to manage those consequences with God, or you can manage them without God. I'd rather manage them with God, because the Bible tells me that his grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. That even though I'm going to be punished, I may be punished for the things that I've done, his grace is sufficient, meaning that it could be a lot worse. Amen? It could be a lot worse. My God, whoo! Well, that is conviction. I'm done with. I'm com I'm done with conviction. I hope you have got a better understanding of what it is to be convicted, and that that to, to understand that when you're guilty, that guilty does not mean that 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 you need to use it as your enemy, but use it as your 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 foe. Use it as your your helper. It's there to help you. It's there to help you. Um. One last scripture, and I'm closing. Psalms chapter 139, verses 23 through 24 in the Message Bible. Psalms 139, verses 23 through 24 in the Message Bible. It says this, investigate my life, O God. Find out everything about me. Cross-examine and test me. Get a clear picture of what I'm about. That's David again. See for yourself whether I've done anything wrong, then guide me on the road to eternal life. That's what you want. You want God to guide you on the road of eternal life to eternal life. And that's what we want. We want eternal life. But we don't want just to be looking forward towards eternal life when we die. We want and as we preached several weeks ago, a month or so ago, about the kingdom of God, we want, we want to experience life and life more abundantly here on earth before God takes us off this earth. We want to have an opportunity to, to enjoy life here on this earth. I, I've learned through my own experience that the best way to do that is to allow my creator to have full control of my life. And in spite of the fact that I may mess up, I may not get it all right, I may falter, I may fail, I love the fact that he gives me an opportunity to get back up again. The Bible says that a righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up again. A righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up again. Are you that righteous man or are you that righteous woman that have fallen, but you need to get back up again? God is still there. He said, and I said it earlier, he said, come, let us reason together. 
Come on, let, let's, let's have a conversation. Let's talk about it. Let's reason together. Let's, let's talk about where you are. Let's talk about the conviction that you're feeling. And let's talk about the guilt. Let's talk about the sin. And let's talk about it. He said, though you may have all this sin in your life. He said, you know what? I'm able to wash away all those things in your life. And I'm able, I'm able, God himself, I'm able to put your life on a brand new start, a brand new beginning. Yeah, there may be some residue from your previous life. But th that, that residue will not, I will not allow that residue to hold you back from being the best that you can be. He says, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, I'll take that residue and I'll turn it around for your good. I'll turn it around for your good, man. I'll take that residue and I'll turn it around for your good. I'll take that residue and I'll, I'll help, I'll, I'll make it enhance your character. You become better for a better person because of the residue. You become a better person. You begin to treat people better because of that residue, because I've turned it around for your good. Bless you all. I want to give those of you that have not given your life to Christ an opportunity to do so. I, I, I recently had a conversation with, with, with someone, and, and, and I, I'm getting a greater and better understanding of this generation, this new generation. And this new generation, have a, they have an issue with believing in Jesus Christ because uh, they believe that the Bible was written by, by men and, and men has used the Bible to, to, uh, to, 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 to uh, um, pollute the consciousness of certain race of people, um, control. They use it as a means of control. And, and I would acknowledge the fact that, yes, the Bible has been used or was used at a certain time in the lives of people to control them. And to this day, it is still used to control certain people. But I want to encourage you to get to know your creator for yourself. When you get to know God for yourself, you'll get to understand why he sent his son to this earth to die for us. You may not believe all that now. Maybe that's not even important for you. to. You need to get to know God first. Get to know your creator first. Because you can't know Jesus without getting to know your creator. So I want you, I, I'm encouraging you, start a relationship with the Father. If you're a sinner, that means you do not have a relationship with the Father. I want to encourage you to have a relationship with the Father. Once you get to know who the Father is, you get to know who the Son is. There's no way in the world you can get to know who the Father is and not know who the Son is. But I encourage you to get to know who the Father is, your Creator. Go to Him. Learn who He is. Watch Him begin to add to your life and begin to, ex begin to uh, uh, ex uh, expose certain things. The Bible calls them mysteries. He's going to begin to open up your eyes to certain mysteries. And He'll begin to change your mindset. Well, you begin to believe and understand. That the Bible is not meant to control you, but it's meant to enhance your life. Amen. If that's you out there, you've never given your life to, to God before. Or you're a person that you've given your life to God before, but you backslid. And you want to rededicate your life today. Well, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. A prayer of rededication, a prayer of salvation. And if that's you, if you have a heart that's willing to do this, if you're at a place where you felt like you've been convicted enough through this sermon, through this teaching, and you want to give your life to Christ today, you want to give your life to God today, I'm going to lead you through this prayer. And all you got to do is repeat after me. Repeat after me if you really believe that this is something that you want to do. Let's pray. Father God, you know my life, and you know how I've lived it. I ask you, Father, to come into my life, come into my heart, and forgive me for my sins. I believe your Bible. It is your word. And in your word, there's truth. I'm asking you, establish a relationship with me that I may know the truth and the truth shall set me free. I want to know who you are and I want to know why you are, who you are in my life. Today, Father, I give you my life, and I believe that you have the very best to offer me. And it's in your son's name I pray. Amen.
Amen. And I have to pray that prayer because I believe in Jesus Christ. And so I have to end my prayer because the Bible tells me that if I ask anything that I ask in the name of Jesus, I shall receive it. So my prayer is that in the name of Jesus, that you shall receive everything that you're coming to God for. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you so much for your patience today. I appreciate it. I pray that today's lesson was a lesson that will encourage your heart. It will catapult you to a higher level in God and that you'll be able to see a difference in your life and in your walk as, as soon or as early as today. Amen. Amen. Look here. This is the Bridge Church of Alabama. We're loving God, loving people, and pursuing purpose. We're doing that by however way God sends us to do it, whether or not he sends us to you or sends you to us. Either way, it's his way, and that's what we want. We want to do it God's way. Look here. I'm Pastor T. God bless you. I love you, and I want you to have a very, 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 very best weekend or week that you can have. I'm Pastor T. I'm out. Y'all have a blessed week. God bless you.